Our speaker tonight is Trudy Miller, and Trudy is beginning her fourth year as an assistant professor, computer information systems and computing and new media technology department at the university. She holds a PhD in management of information systems and technology from Claremont Graduate College, Graduate University. That's in California, correct? Yep, and did you say Graduate College? Like they just yeah. switched to university. They just switched the university. Everyone's doing that, you know. Just change your name and it makes you sound, you know, bigger and stronger. Works for me. As well as degrees from Dalhousie yeah. University. I always have trouble with that word. And Queens University in Canada. Uh, her research interests include information systems, consumer health informatics, user interface design, and video game design. She's developed and taught courses in systems analysis and design, design patterns, programming, and information systems. Recently, she has had papers accepted at the ACM Creativity and Cognition Conference and the International Conference on Electronic Business to be held in Bangkok, Thailand, aren't you one? So you're going to be going to that, eh? Next one. Yeah. Um, so I want to welcome Trudy to the uh, Community Lecture Series. Her topic tonight is Living, Earning, and Learning Video Games in the 21st Century. And the way we hold these normally is that the uh, speaker usually gives about 40, 45 minute talk, and then we open it for questions. We try to keep questions until that time, unless there's a real clarification point. In which case you can choose to address the question. And then we usually have 15 to 20 minutes of questions, and then I usually cut it off. And if you want to talk to her afterwards, you're free to do so. So, Dr. Miller, it's all yours. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hey, I'm still Trudy. Um, and I'm going to be talking today, as mentioned, about uh, uh, living, earning, and learning video games in the 21st century. Um, I have sort of four sections. That would be three of them. But the first one, is a brief introduction of video games. Now, I'm sure most, if not all of you, know a little bit about games, which is hopefully why you're here today. But I want to kind of give you a context for games and also explain how games today may differ from games that you loved 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or in some of our cases, 30 years ago. Um, so in the beginning, the first, uh, the first sort of agreed upon video game that meets the criteria of games, and we'll talk about what those are uh, a little bit later, um, was Space War, which was developed at uh, MIT on a uh, system called the PDP-1, which was an early computer that was primarily used for scientific experiments. And it is credited to Steve Russell, although there's large suggestions that, as is wont at uh, MIT labs, many, many people <laughs> were, may have been involved in late night um, Coca-Cola and uh, M&M related uh, programming assistance. But this was actually a two player game where the large bl uh, blur on the top would chase the small blur on the bottom. And these blurs were supposed to be spaceships that could shoot at each other, which is quite advanced uh, compared to other games, certainly in the 60s, of which there were very few other ones recorded. There are some recent competitors that have come to light, and um, I don't know how they're going to prove if these are true or not. One is Knots and Crosses, which was at uh, Cambridge University, which we here know as Tic-Tac-Toe. Um, and a second one was Tennis for Two, which I suspect, given the machines of the time, was probably similar to the game Pong, because I can't imagine there were humans playing tennis. I'm actually shocked that this is the output for Space War, given that you know in the 80s, 20 years later, all we had was like a square that was yellow chasing a square that was white. So <laughs> in the early years, and this is when I was uh, quite young, and when games became commercially available both in arcades, where you had the large stand-up machines, like here shown on the left. Um, for those of you not old enough to remember this, this was an awesome time. This was when you'd have rooms as big as this or larger than this, the size of gymnasiums, and it would just be lined with what are called arcade cabinets. Each one back then typically only played one game, and you would put a quarter in, and you'd get two or three lives, depending on the game. Um, and uh, one of my favorite games from that time is Burger Time, where you make hamburgers. Not to be confused with my favorite real life pastime, which is eating burgers. Um, so I can see the relationship. Another huge game from this time was Pac-Man. Um, and in the case of some of these games like Pac-Man, I've grabbed more recent screens, um, just because they're prettier. Um, one of the first games to be released at home was uh, Pong and variations thereof, where you controlled this vertical line and this little square would bounce back and forth between this line and either this, would, this other vertical line, these are the characters, the vertical lines, would go move up and down either controlled by the computer or by another human and you would use um, turn wheels where you'd go back and forth. And so people would pay hundreds of dollars for machines where basically all it would play is this one game. There were no cartridges, you couldn't swap the games. And the really scary thing is one of my friends had one of these in their basements 
in probably the mid 80s. So like I'd already played Super Mario Brothers and it actually is still a lot of fun to trash talk and try to play Pong um, if you're bored. There were other games came out, Pitfall, Utopia, you had a variety of different consoles came out and you started seeing sort of a, a culture grow around video games. So you didn't just have these machines in people's living rooms, you started to have a lot more um, sort of what would be called swag around it. When Pac-Man came out, it took a lot of people by storm, not only here in the United States, but in several countries abroad, including where I lived in Canada, um, in Japan, etc. And Pac-Man really spawned almost everything. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Shrinky Dinks, which were things you colored in and put in the oven and they shrank. And then I don't know what you're supposed to do with them. They were like tiny hard plastic, but a lot of people had them. And Pac-Man um, made it in there. It made Mad Magazine's time of the year, one, or, sorry, cover of the year, making fun of time. This is actually a very, very often misquoted um, non-fact, if you will, is that Pac-Man won man, Time's Man of the Year, but it never did. It just made it on Mad. And because the, the uh, satire or spoof was so good, many people still think, I think there's a trivial pursuit question related to it, and, which asks you and says, who was it in this year, or what's the only video game character to ever won? And the answer is Pac-Man, and it's wrong, because Pac-Man was never character of the year. You have everything from family circus, air fresheners, coloring books, etc. Now, sometimes when people think about video games, this is the era that they think about, especially if they haven't kept up with it, or they stereotype it with that. Part of the reason is because in 1983, 1984, there was a huge crash in the video game market. At that time, we saw trends similar to what we see now in games where sales kept going up and up and up and up. And much like the housing market recently, people didn't see any ends to that. Well, there were several problems that uh, sort of culminated all at once that really led it to a huge crash in the market. The dollar values went downhill very, very quickly, and uh, stores could not even move games. Games in, the, in Canada that they were charging $80 for, the, within three to four months, they couldn't get rid of them at four or five dollars. So why is that? Why did the price change so, so quickly? Well, the first was that there were way too many consoles, or way too many different machines that didn't share uh, games or cartridges. You had the Atari 2600, two versions of the Intellivision, some games would play on the Intellivision, some would play on the Intellivision 2, some would play on both. But you could imagine in the early 80s, people didn't want to have to figure that out. Like they were like, no. There was the Odyssey 2, ColecoVision, the Fairchild Channel F, Vectrex. There were a whole bunch of other standalone machines like Pong. It just became very confusing when people went into stores. Second, people made really, really big mistakes that if you've ever taken any business classes or worked in a business or have common sense, they just don't make sense. For example, um, Atari wanted to release Pac-Man, again a huge game, and to be the first Pac-Man that you could buy and play in your house. This seems like a really good idea because Pac-Man was making literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in probably every state in arcades. You can't imagine, people were just putting quarter after quarter after quarter. And um, what they did was they said, well people are going to buy Atari systems because we have Pac-Man. Okay, that's probably a safe bet and we could probably do a model based on that, an economic model. So they made 12 million copies of Pac-Man, but the problem was the number of, sh of consoles that they had manufactured and sold at that point was 10 million. So they really overestimated that every single person who had an Atari ever was going to buy one, and they were going to sell 20% more consoles within a short period of time. Not a lot of sense. There were also some other huge issues which were, which at this point a lot of people were getting into making games, so you ended up with a lot of games that were similar. Things like Pac-Man, which was Pac-Man, only Pac-Man was a square, or um, you know, jumping up and down man, or really, really lame, um, even Purina, you know the dog food company, released a game called Chase the Chuck Wagon. I have seen this game, it's, I've seen it for sale, and I've seen screenshots of it, and you just basically chase a wagon that drops what I think is supposed to be some sort of food. <laughs> it looks like a big pile of squares. But to give you an idea, again, poor folks who are not, um, technologically savvy, you didn't have the internet to consult, you didn't have video game reviews on television or in magazines or in books at that point, would go in and say, I'm going to pay $80 for, fortunately Chase the Chuck Wagon was never in, you had to sell, send in um, UPCs to get those games. But people would go in and spend, spend $80 and you'd get it home and you'd be like, this is the worst thing ever. Like this is, I move to the left and my thing doesn't even move. Um, and so people were getting really, really disheartened by the market. And then finally, the personal computer revolution, for which I also benefit, and I probably wouldn't be in front of you today if that hadn't happened, um, also happened in 1983 and 84. You saw the Commodore 64, the Atari uh, produced uh, keyboards that were fairly successful, and also, of course, IBM came out with its personal computer, um, and Apple did in 1984 as well, with its famous 1984 commercial at that time as well. What saved us and saved you from listening to a lecture from me today about programming or something non-video game related 
was uh, really Nintendo. Nintendo was a company uh, and is a family-owned company uh, located in Japan that prior to uh, creating handheld games that were uh, LCD based like um, there was Game and Watch and Oil Panic etc made cards, card games. They got into the electronic entertainment business and the, of course one of the most famous things that they produced was uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt and it sold hundreds of millions of copies throughout the world. But to give you an idea of where we've come since this time, for those of us that it doesn't really seem that long since this came out, Nintendo has had several iterations of its console in terms of what physically is in the hardware and also um, what they're able to do. So let's take a look just at Nintendo, not looking at other consoles like uh, those that offered by Sony or Microsoft. So in 85 they came out with the Nintendo. In 1991 they came out with the Super Nintendo and some of you may remember these. You can still buy these actually locally, um, these machines. Nintendo 64 came out in 1960, uh, 1966, 1996. This one is of course famous for Mario 64 and making three-dimensional graphics. In 2001, the GameCube came out. I'm sure many of you either owned these or have seen them in people's homes, little cubes. Um, which you, there actually was a study, you can throw them off a two-story building and as long as they don't land on the handle, they will, they will survive that and be able to continue playing, which I thought was really cool. And then of course, uh, one of the best-selling consoles today, which is the Nintendo Wii, which is the motion-sensitive um, uh, baton controller, if you will. So just in this relatively short period of time, we have five major hardware, uh, hardware cycles within Nintendo alone. And Nintendo is actually fairly consistent with the other hard, large hardware manufacturers, but unlike cars, they don't come out every year, but there are substantial differences between each one. To give you another idea from our side of things, what we actually see, because hardware may or may not be exciting to you, but I like to, okay, what can they do, right? I mean, this is, a, I can show you a box and say, it did something in 1991, who cares? Here's, let's take a look. In 1987, I picked a series that has been going on since 1987. On the original Nintendo, you had a game called Final Fantasy, where you controlled four characters that are on the right, of various stages of dress, and you would fight enemies that appeared on the left. You can see it's somewhat, not math heavy, but number heavy, especially for, uh, for young children. I remember when this came out in 1987, I was like, no. <laughs> if I have to do math, I don't want to play. <laughs> Which, of course, you know, that's sad. But <laughs> if you want to see the same series of games, the game that they put out uh, two years ago in 2010, this is what the graphics look like today for the same kind of scene, a battle scene. So in this case, you have two large fighting fireballs, two characters. You can see you still have the attack options um, and the scores. And we'll also take a look at some uh, graphics that are larger and a little bit more detailed. But just within one series, they've kept the gameplay fairly consistent. What has it done in the interim? Well, if you want to get an idea of the different versions of this particular game and this type of battle scene, you can see from 1987, it hasn't been an overnight change. It's been a gradual change with increasing hardware increasing software development abilities, um, finding out what works and what doesn't work. You'll notice that the character names appear in all four, or sorry, all six uh, screens. It's difficult to see on the last one. Their hit points, there still are a lot of numbers. They're much smaller because game developers have figured out most people are a little scared of numbers. But um, almost every part of games excuse me, has evolved with the graphics. So music is no longer beep boop, beep boop, Synthesizer music, although it is in some cool games, but you have full symphonies playing, um, soundtracks performing concerts, um, releasing those CDs uh, for commercial sale. You have storylines. I would argue that stories is probably where games have not evolved as quickly because it's a lot of people like me writing them instead of people with actual um, authoring talent. We're starting to see that come in and that's really good. Um, the speed at which things can happen, the number of different things that can happen, the length of games is really increasing over time as well. So on to the first of the three sections, living, earning, and learning. One of the big sort of goals or one of the big purposes of games, and certainly its initial point, was to entertain us, to spend a lot of time. I'm not going to deal with, um, in this particular presentation, I'm not talking specifically about um, people who use games for escapism. So for example, there uh, are people who um, want to debate whether or not games can be addictive or addiction. And if you want to ask me questions about that, I'll be happy. But for people who use them health, healthfully and in a, in a good way, games can be very, very entertaining. Who uses and plays games? Well, according to the Pew Internet and American Life Project, which when I check their methods and their surveying seem to be very accurate and unbiased, say that 97% of teenagers play games, 53% of adults, including 50% of adult women play games. 
One of the reasons they were able to get such high numbers compared to other uh, surveys in the past was they made sure they listed games that people typically don't think of as video games, like Free Cell, Solitaire, um, Breakout on your, your uh, Blackberry for people who use Blackberries, etc. Those are video games. I mean, they are. And if you ask people, do you play these, people say yes. For example, my mother plays Solitaire. She will not play anything else since we beat her at Wii Bowling. <laughs> it was sad, my grandmother won. She had not played a video game before. And my mom was like, that's it. No more Wii for me. Um, it was very entertaining. But again, when, you start, when people start saying, oh, that's a game, or I guess that is a video game, because people sometimes have stereotypes that it has to be Pac-Man, or it has to be shooting, or it has to be violent or something. And that's not necessarily the case. The Entertainment Software um, Alliance, no, sorry, Association, uh, in 2011, uh, came up with a report that the average gamer is in their mid-30s. And if you take a look at the number of people who don't play games <laughs> uh, at the uh, later age spectrum, it means that there's quite a few young folks playing games, but it's not the stereotype of a 15 or 16 year old, typically male, which is the, the stereotype that you hear over and over, both in the literature as well as magazines. If you've ever read a gaming magazine, they, the humor is very mad magazine. Um, which again, isn't necessarily bad, but it, it may not appeal to a 30-year-old woman, for example. Games today are now pretty much ubiquitous. If you have electronic devices, you have access to games. So you have things like um, home consoles, like the Wii, the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3. You also have them on computers. You have them on tablet PCs, so things like iPads. You have them on cell phones. And then you also have them within social media. So if you use Facebook, um, gaming within Facebook, and things like um, uh, Mafia Wars, or I don't play these games because I need to spend some time working, and so I'm not as familiar with them as I should be, um, but you certainly can play them almost anywhere. And actually, it's very funny, when I go visit some of my friends, and you have probably seen this with some of your friends, if people are playing a game that, that they get notifications when they have a turn, they'll be talking to someone, be like, la la, and then they'll be like, just a second, beep, blue, 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 blue. and uh, they'll, they'll respond, and you're like, uh, aren't you interacting with me? What's going on? It's really quite entertaining. If you want to know how many current systems there are that have been sold, we're looking in the millions. And actually, if you look at um, the Nintendo DS, which is Nintendo's dual screen handheld system, it actually has sold more um, over its lifespan, which is quite long, than iPhones, which given how ubiquitous and how much iPhones have taken the world by storm, is incredible. And uh, these, yeah, are worldwide hardware totals. Um, within the US, the uh, the it's lower numbers, clearly, because they're included in worldwide, but you see a slightly different balance of the different systems. The Xbox 360, for example, doesn't sell particularly well in Japan, but it does sell very well, comparatively, uh, here in the United States. I wanted to include uh, the Packers and show you some graphics that you can see in today's game. And this is from what I've been led to believe an actual gameplay photo of the Packers uh, playing football in Madden 2012, the most recent edition of Madden. Um, two of the things that I really like about Madden demonstrating their games are the grass, and you can see those weird things that look like blurs on this player's leg are actually blades of grass that he's kicked up as he's running. They also have really, really neat weather effects, and I was trying to find a good picture or video that showed this, and I just couldn't find one that wasn't so grainy it would look bad here. But if you have access to a computer and you wanted to see some of the neat weather effects that we'll start to see more and more, the kinds of weather effects that when you see them in movies, you don't really know that they're special effects, but when you watch them in a video game, you know it's not videotaped, so it has to be a special effect. Um, Madden does very good, very, very good rain um, in the fact that your, 